Hi, I'm Tony Burroughs, author of Black Roots, and you're listening to Genealogy Gems Podcast. Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to episode 69 of the Genealogy Gems podcast. I really appreciate that you are taking time out of your week to listen in, and I think I've got some really good stuff for you this week that will make it worthwhile. First of all, there has been a lot happening in the genealogy world. Uh, Things certainly don't slow down just because it's summertime, do they? And as we roll into the month of August, Footnote.com has just launched a new promotion. They are opening the entire interactive 1930 U.S. Census for free throughout the month of August. All the indexes in their entirety are always free on Footnote. However, for the month of August 2009, they are providing free access to the images as well. So it's a great chance to take a look at the most current census available and try out Footnote at the same time. So to get the free access, just go to footnote.com slash 1930census and register with your email. Next, I want to direct your attention to the Genealogy Insider blog by Diane Haddad at Family Tree Magazine. She had a really good post on her blog this last week uh, about a new, very useful genealogy tool with sort of a funny name. It's called Nukmuk. I know. (laughs) I know that's a little odd sounding. It actually stands for the National Union Catalog of Manuscript Collections. And according to Diane, it's celebrating its 50th year. Well, now the National Union Catalog of Manuscript Collections, now you definitely know why they call it NUCMUC for short. (laughs) It's much easier to say. NUCMUC is a free Library of Congress program And now they have staff members who are entering information about the manuscript collections of participating U.S. libraries into the WorldCat Library Catalog search engine. And that makes those entries searchable by all of us for our research. Nutmuck started out and continued on as a printed volume. uh, And finally, in 2009, it made its way online. Diane says the catalog uh, might contain entries for old newspapers, letters, diaries, and much more from local individuals and businesses. But these unique collections would be pretty hard to track down at individual libraries if it weren't for Nukmuk. So head to the Genealogy Insider for the full scoop, including links to Nukmuk and a guide to doing searches with it. I guess it's a little bit complicated, so the guide is supposed to be very helpful. And uh, you can find the blog about it at blog.familytreemagazine.com slash insider. And the post date is July 30th, 2009 for that article. Or you can just use the direct link to the blog post called The Useful Genealogy Tool with the Funny Name that I'll have for you in the show notes for this episode. (laughs) And speaking of Family Tree Magazine, I had a wonderful time this last week. I conducted a a webinar, a seminar, a webinar for Family Tree Magazine. Um, Basically, an online class. We had a lot of people from all over the country attending the class. And what it is, is you sign in online, and you can get on your telephone or have a headset. And I did the entire presentation, so everybody is watching my screen and is able to see all the slides. And and we covered newspapers, newspaper research, which is one of my favorite subjects. And as we got to the end, then we had a QA and a session, and there's a little chat window, and people can type in their questions, and we can interact, and I can answer them. And it was just a lot of fun. And I hope uh, everybody who attended had a good time and learned some new tips, some great ways as a kind of a strategy to go about how to determine not just, you know, where papers are, but which papers you're looking for, because that's half the challenge. And if the papers you want were around at the time when your ancestors were. So anyway, thanks so much to Family Tree Magazine for inviting me over there to present the newspapers webinar, and hopefully we'll do more in the future. That was a lot of fun. And we were talking about the Genealogy Insider blog. Um, Speaking of genealogy bloggers, I've been covering them in depth in in my other podcast called Family History, Genealogy Made Easy. 
Episode 38 is my interview with the popular blogger, The Footnote Maven, who has two blogs, The Footnote Maven blog and The Shades of the Departed blog. Now, if you've ever wondered what in the world is a blog, or if you've been reading them for a while and you kind of wondered who the folks were behind the blogs, or if you've been toying around with the idea of blogging about your family history yourself, well, in all of these cases, you are going to find the gems of information, advice, and the wisdom from the footnote maven really helpful. And I want to say a special thank you to genealogy blogger Randy Seaver over at the Genia Musings blog for writing about my interview with the footnote maven and sharing it with his readers. Uh, his post is dated July 24th of 2009, and you can find that over at geniamusings.com. And of course, thanks to the footnote maven herself. Um, for her post about the episode on the Footnote Maven blog. She wrote a really sweet post, and she took a photo of me and turned it into this beautiful little vintage piece of art. She's such a talented lady. you got to go over there and check that out just to see kind of how she did that. I think she said it was out of her, the uh, background was out of her own vintage postcard collection. And then in episode 39 of the Family History Podcast, you will find even more genealogy bloggers. That episode features the very gifted writer, Denise Levenick, who writes uh, the Family Curator blog. And she also has an alter ego known as Penny Dreadful, who writes occasionally for the Footnote Maven's Shades of the Departed blog. And you get two bloggers in this episode because it also features my interview with Shelley Talalay Dardashti, who writes the Tracing the Tribe blog on Jewish genealogy. You know, both these ladies are really experienced bloggers, and they give us some great tips on blogging, including dispelling the myth that you have to be technically inclined to blog. Here's a tip. You don't. <laughs> and they'll tell you all the reasons why. So tune into uh, episodes 38 and 39 of Family History if you'd like to learn more and hear more about the bloggers that are out there. Now, this next item I wanted to talk to you about, you know, it could happen to any family historian. You know, you toil for decades on your genealogy, you pull it all together, and you finally get it self-published, and you bestow a copy of that precious tome on your local library or other repository. Then you find out that it's on Google Books. And there was a man from Halifax, Nova Scotia, who this happened to. He published his own family history in a limited number of um, books, maybe hardbound books, with the promise to some of his older relatives that that information would not be published to the entire world on the internet. They just weren't all that comfortable with it. But one day, he was doing a Google search, and up popped his family history book in Google Books. Well, what started as a desire on his part to share his accomplishment with the local library, it actually ended up in a battle with Google. But just how did Google get its mitts on his book? Well, the lesson here is that once our precious family history is placed in a public repository, it's as good as on the internet. I covered this idea specifically in a past Genealogy Gems Premium member episode, and I currently talk about it in my Save Your Research from Destruction presentation that I give at genealogy conferences around the country. Because once your research is gifted to another organization, like a historical society, a library, that type of thing, you lose control over it. And a lot of people don't realize that. You know, the repository can shelve it, they can toss it, or they can give it away to another repository. And it kind of sounds like that's kind of what happened to the man in Halifax, because his book ended up at the library of the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And that's where Google stepped in. The university's library was one of 20 that were being digitized by Google under the agreement of the Google Library Project. And the author, he stumbled upon it during an internet search, and he was absolutely furious. Well, Google agreed to remove the book from Google Books, and so now there is a settlement in the works pending a ruling from a New York judge. And this settlement will affect you if you publish your work and share it in any way with a public library, whether through a donation or a sale where you actually sell the book to the library. Now, according to the agreement that, that's being kind of carved out here, there are three types of books according to Google. 
First, there are in copyright and in print books. And Google defines these as books that publishers are still actively selling, the ones you see at the most bookstores. This agreement expands the online marketplace for in-print books by letting authors and publishers turn on the preview and purchase models that make their titles more easily available through book search. And we'll talk about this in just a minute. Um, the second type of book that, they, that Google defines is the in-copyright but out-of-print books. And Google defines out-of-print books as ones that aren't actually being published or sold. So the only way to procure one is to track it down in a library or used bookstore. When this agreement is approved, every out-of-print book that Google digitizes will become available online for preview and purchase unless its author or publisher chooses to turn off that title. Google believes it will be a tremendous boon to the publishing industry to enable authors and publishers to earn money from volumes they might have thought were gone forever from the marketplace. And finally, there are out-of-copyright books. Now, Google says that this agreement doesn't affect how they will display out-of-copyright books. They'll continue to allow book search users to read, download, and print those titles just like we do now. Well, What's really fascinating to me is that it appears that Google and the Authors Guild and the Association of American Publishers, they're the folks who got together to work on this settlement. They kind of appear to be deciding copyright law, if you think about it. I mean, essentially, they have decided that Google will have the digital rights to your published work unless you proactively contact them and ask to have your book removed. And you have to do that within a certain time frame. So then the question kind of popped into my mind, well, why would the Authors Guild and the Association of American Publishers go along with this idea? Well, I'm no expert. I don't claim to be on this subject, but I've been doing some research, and I'm curious because I have published some of my own things. And it looks to me like this agreement actually creates a new potential revenue stream for these organizations, the Authors Guild and uh, the Association of American Publishers. You see, Google's going to essentially have an online digital bookstore. That's what they were talking about in those definitions, where customers can purchase digital copies of books. And Google says that it will, quote, allow rights holders, if they wish, to include in-print books and will create a mechanism for payments to authors and publishers by establishing a book's rights registry. <laughs> for the big publishing companies and established authors, it's going to be easy for Google to track them down and make payments to them for works made available through the book rights registry that's being created. Um, this is the same registry where the man from Halifax would have to go to request his digital rights not be given to Google. And so will you, I think if you publish in the future. Now, I'll have a link to the book's rights registry in the show notes for you so you can take a look at it for yourself. So this kind of brings us all back to that foggy part of the situation. The book's rights registry, when you look at it, it's written in such a way that makes it sound like it's only about completing the settlement and that it only applies to books that were on Google Books during the complaint period and that they are eligible to have... Uh, to submit their claim, whether they want a, a one-time $60 cash payment or if they want to have their book removed. But they have to do it by January 5th of 2010. But what about after that? Now, maybe one of you listening out there have come across the answer to this question, and I hope that you will email me and let me know if you do know the answer. But it's really unclear what's going to happen to the digital rights of books published after the settlement date. Does Google automatically get the digital rights to those simply because they have an agreement with these two large organizations that, frankly, you and I are likely not a member of? <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. I'm not asking these questions because I don't like what Google Books does. Actually, it's far from it. I love searching Google Books for information on my ancestors. But at the same time, many of us who are involved in genealogy also at some point in our lives publish. And with the sometimes sensitive nature of family history, it can get kind of tricky when you're trying to decide which information to publish and how far you want to publish it. Which, of course, brings me back to my original statement. We have to assume, at this point, that once our precious family history is published, 
and placed in a public library repository, it's as good as on the internet. And the second point is that Google may end up profiting financially from your work. So I'd love to know, what do you think about this? And what have you heard about this? Um, have you published your own family history? Does it matter to you who owns the digital rights to your work? I'd really love to hear your thoughts on this. So email me at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com or better yet, call the voicemail line at 925-272-4021 to have your thoughts included on the show. You know, I love bringing these genealogical gems to you that help boost your research and build a strong family tree. And it's important to me to always have free podcasts available so that everyone can participate. If you enjoy these free shows and you would like to help me cover the costs of bringing them to you each week, there's a really easy way to do that that won't cost you a thing. By coming to my website at genealogygems.tv whenever you need to do some shopping online and accessing your favorite stores and websites through the links that you find on my site, you financially support the show. The price you pay is exactly the same, but Genealogy Gems receives a small percentage for referring you. It's just that simple. Amazon is one of my all-time favorite places to shop online. They have just about everything and at incredibly competitive prices. So next time you're looking for books, DVDs, software, electronics, apparel, pretty much anything at all, head to genealogygems.tv and click the Amazon ad that you find on the homepage or throughout the website. And these free podcasts will benefit by any shopping that you do and you will get the same super low prices. Everybody wins. So if you enjoyed the Genealogy Gems podcast and the Family History Genealogy Made Easy podcast, let your mouse do the shopping through the ads and links on the Genealogy Gems website, and together we'll keep new episodes coming for a long time to come. Profile America, Saturday, August 1st. This month, in 1790, the young United States began its first census, as required by the Constitution. It took 18 months for federal marshals to complete that first count. When they started, there were only the 13 original colonies, but Vermont and Kentucky joined the Union during the census. Today, as the nation grows in population and housing units, it takes 10 years to prepare for the next census. Those taking next year's census face the daunting task of finding and reaching those living in every house from Hawaii to Maine. The 1790 census counted just under 4 million people. The population in 2010 is projected to be just over 310 million. You can find these and more facts about America from the U.S. Census Bureau online at census.gov. Tony Burroughs is an internationally known genealogist, author, and former adjunct genealogy professor at Chicago State University. He lectures throughout the United States and Canada on all aspects of genealogy. He is the author of the book, Black Roots, A Beginner's Guide to Tracing the African-American Family Tree, published by the Fireside Division of Simon & Schuster. And I recently had a chance to sit down and talk with Tony about his work and his approach to the research process. I'm here at the Southern California Genealogical Jamboree with Tony Burroughs. Welcome, Tony, to the show. Good. Good seeing you. How are you? Great. Doing great. Um, I saw your name on the list, speakers list. I had to do my little run through before I got here, and I said, got to talk to Tony. Got to see what you're up to. You're teaching a lot of classes, and I know you've got uh, great books and things. So first of all, tell us what classes have they rigged you into doing here at (laughs) at the Jamboree? Uh, The first one I'm doing is called The Nature Genealogy. And that deals with when you're an experienced person and you find a new ancestor, what do you do? How do you research that person, you know? And so it talks about a strategy, you know, rather than just jumping into stuff, okay? Then I'm doing one called Lights, Camera, Action. I saw that and I was wondering what that was about. Yes. What that does is it uh, shows you how to take all your research and make a, use it for a documentary film. Oh, great. So it's like a genealogy documentary film. Yes. And then I'm doing one on the six phases of African-American genealogy, Mm -hmm. which again talks about the overall look at African-American genealogy, 
when it's the same, when it differs, and then the different phases of what you have to go through to go from A to B to C to D. And then I'm doing one on, uh, what, DNA. Oh, wow. <laughs> you have quite a diversity of subjects here. Yes, DNA. yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. And how DNA adds to the genealogy mix, you know, if you're doing European or African American. So how many is that? Four. Uh, four, and I've got one more. What's the other one? The other one is... Uh, <laughs> well, if you're going to be there, he may just be doing a tap dance and singing oh, I know, a song. I know, I know. It's called Anatomy of a Pension File. Oh, yes. I saw that one. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So that deals with if you have an ancestor that was in the military and he got a pension, how do you get that pension? And when you get it, how do you deal with the information that's in it, you know, mm -hmm. to help? Mm -hmm progress your genealogy. So I break down that whole pension file to show you what the pieces are, what they mean, and how they can lead you to other sources. So I'm guessing <laughs> that with this kind of a wide range of classes, right. and all of them really can take yes. our genealogy so much further, yes. how long have you been doing this? Oh, uh, just a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe it. Well, I've been doing it maybe about 30 years. Wow. Yeah, wow. yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while. And yeah. uh, the dream job, is this your dream job? This is, I guess so. I never planned on it. Just really? evolved that way, and one thing just led to another. And people say you should do what you enjoy doing, and that's what I do. I love to go to work every day. That's what I was thinking. Or shall I say, I love to work every day. I don't necessarily go to work. <laughs> I was say, are you one of the ones in your slippers and your jammies working from oh, your yeah. home office? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. No video phone. <laughs> yeah, I had to, to to force him here into uh, doing a little video here. <laughs> Well, I'm thinking about particularly, he just mentioned the class about if you find, you're an experienced genealogist, yes. you find an ancestor, right. and you must be watching me when I'm doing my research because <laughs> I just start like jumping here and jumping there because you're right. so excited, right? Oh, absolutely. But yeah. you're talking yes. about, oh no, let's be a little more organized yes. and have a game plan. Yes. Tell us a yes. little bit yes. more about yes. that. Yes. I'm really exactly. intrigued. Well, what happens normally when we find a new ancestor, we say, oh, wow, here's a new person. So we jump in and we try to find them in the census, mm -hmm. you know, or you know, some other kind of record. And we don't stop to think, well, whatever record I'm looking for, do I understand that record? Is this the first record I should look for? Do I have enough information to look in that record? You know, or what should be the first record I look at in order to ensure that I have success? So, for example, um, say you have an ancestor and you know they died, and you said, oh, well, let me go get a probate. Do you know what a probate is? Do you know what a will is? Do you understand the probate process? You know, and so that's what it's really talking about, to really understand the records, understand the repositories, understand the research before you start looking for your ancestor. But we, like you said, we get so excited, we start looking for our ancestor, not even thinking about, you know, is this the right thing I should be doing, you know. Was, then we get frustrated, you know, and don't understand why. Yeah, I, I was just interviewing an, uh, Julie Miller, who's a certified genealogist, and she was yeah. saying that about alien records, mm -hmm. and, and if you understand the process of somebody coming across to America, yes. um, who would have thought, oh, before you go running to look for them in the census, you need to mm -hmm. stop where they registered. Exactly. And that's the same kind exactly. of concept, it sounds exactly. like. Exactly. So exactly. really yes, knowing yes. birth to death, what right. may have occurred, and in what order it sounds like. And, and, and in addition to that, understand the historical context. Mm -hmm. Because once we, you know, just narrow our focus on genealogy, we forget the broader picture. Yeah. You know, we don't understand the historical circumstances and how that plays a role in doing our research and how it plays a role in being successful and understanding our ancestor. Now, speaking of historical context, you have your book, Black Roots, yeah. and I would guess that there again, you have to really understand the lives mm -hmm. of uh, black Americans, people who, the process that they went through, the kinds of records and how they may differ. Tell us more about your book and what people will glean from that. Well, what I did was I was speaking around the country and people wanted me to recommend them a good book on black genealogy. And I said, well, duh, I can't. <laughs> I better write it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And that's what happened, you know. Yeah. And so I, I want to do something simple, something easy, you know. And then when I got it done, uh, I let a few people look at it. And they made me some great critiques and reviews on it, which I was so glad I did that, you know. And then I realized that the book was lacking a whole lot because it wasn't into context. 
you know. Mm -hmm. I had some charts, but the charts were like blank charts. I said, hey, fill them in. And someone said, well, <laughs> duh, what do they look like when they get filled in, you yeah, know? Yeah. So I said, well, maybe I should include my charts and fill in the blanks, you know. And once I did that, this whole world just opened up, you know. It's like the book really came alive. Mm -hmm. So it's like when you read the book, it's not only a how-to, but it's kind of like a visual showing you the process of genealogy develop and evolve. And I take you from A to B to C to D. And I looked at some other books, and I saw that a lot of people wanted to talk about soup to nuts, just kind of like okay. everything. Here's your checklist. Right. Mm -hmm. But it was very shallow. It didn't really teach people how to do the research. So I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to limit my scope, but I'm going to go into more depth and detail so people really understand what they're going through and how each part is made and how one step will lead you to another step. So I talk about sequencing in addition okay. to just records because you need to understand the records but you under, need to understand the sequence and if you don't understand the sequence you get into things at the wrong time and again that's where it leads to frustration and you don't understand why it can be really easy to get um, kind of caught up in piece by piece or a record here and a record there but like you say if you don't really understand the thought process behind it and what was going on and going on in history um, chances are you're going to end up painting in a corner somewhere, right? Absolutely. And you can't get yourself out of the, out of the corner. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and it's like, um, once you understand the process, then it, it appears so simple. You said, oh, wow, well, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because there is a method to the madness, but you need to see, <laughs> you know, what the plan is, you know. Once you see the plan, it's like, oh, well, that makes very, very good sense. I was doing a workshop once, an all-day program. And in the afternoon, a lady was sitting in the front row. She started slapping her head. I just stopped her. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, what are you doing? She said, I understand now. I understand now why I've been so frustrated. I didn't understand you were supposed to do A, B, and C before you did D. But it makes so much logical sense. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's kind of like what it's about, you know. Uh, and so people get to learn a little bit about African American history and about the records and about the sequencing of records. And a lot of people said, well, you know, this book is not about black genealogy. Anybody can use this. And it, it really is because it talks about the methodology. But yeah. unfortunately for African Americans, if it doesn't say that on the title or on the label, they're not going to think it's about them because so many books don't cover black genealogy. Right. So I said, well, you know, I'll put that label on there so African Americans will realize this is their book, but anybody can use it. They can just substitute African American for Irish American or Polish American or whatever their ethnic group the is. The logic, the common sense, all of that remains the same. Exactly. There must be some, exactly. there obviously are some unique situations and things that they'll have to keep in mind that you're going to be able to address specifically in the book, but oh, overall absolutely. the process oh, absolutely. is the same. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Well, the process this is similar. Similar. It is okay. similar. It's similar. But there, there are some, some circumstances of which you're going to have to deviate and take that road another way because, again, we place our ancestors in historical context. Right. So for African Americans, it's one of discrimination, yeah. one of poverty, uh, prejudice, and all those kinds of things. So understanding those kinds of things helps us with our research. For example, one just small example, yeah. America was built upon segregation. So some of the records are segregated. So you need to understand which records are integrated and which records are segregated. And when you realize that some are segregated, then where do you have to take that fork in the road off and look in another direction and look for some other different types of records? Fascinating. Now, I'm guessing that your work in um, black genealogy and writing your book, did that lead to your getting involved with the Oprah Roots show and, and African American <laughs> lives? How did that all come about? I have no idea. <laughs> um, actually, it really kind of started before then. Uh, PBS, KBYU did a program called Ancestors right. about 10 years ago. And uh, they asked me to be... Uh, they asked me to do the African American episode, that one, but then they came out with a sequel and they wanted me to do just a regular expert. And so really from that, then a lot of the TV things kind of grew out from that, but that was really before my book had come out, you know. Oh, wow. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. They so, found you. Yeah. I remember uh, when Ancestors came out, it's a great series yes. on just kind of the basic yes. how-to, each piece yes. of the process, and yes. oh, yeah. um, what is coming up in the future What's for coming Tony up in Burroughs? the future, guys? So many different things. I'm working on a ton of articles. In fact, um, I had a coach review my list of articles, and she said, 
gosh, you've really got to prioritize this because, you know, you never have a chance for the rest of your life to finish writing all these. <laughs> so I've got a ton of articles I'm working on. There's several books that I'm working on. Uh, there's some multimedia projects that I'm working on. There's some web technology stuff I'm working on. So I'm working on a lot of different things in a lot of different areas. You know. Very interested. Yeah. Well, speaking of web projects, tell us where we can find your website. Oh, uh, it's not really difficult. <laughs> www.tonyburrows.com. We can do that. You can do that. Okay, good. So I have a list of my speaking engagements. I've got a couple how-to tips, and uh, and I got some biographic information. But I'm getting ready to take that to a whole new level. Add a lot of multimedia stuff on there. You know, Fantastic. But they, can, they can keep coming back periodically. And they can find your your books there as well. I mean, I yes. see you've got uh, Black Roots and also Finding Your Family History in the Attic. Yes. Yes. What That's would a be video I did with one, oh. two, three genealogy. Yes. And it talks about, it's actually a video, and I go through someone's house and I make all kinds of genealogical discoveries inside their house. Will you come over to my house? I would love to. That would <laughs> be fantastic. <laughs> Look, you got to visit uh, Tony's website, tonyburrows.com. Tony, thank you so much. Considering thank your you. busy speaking schedule, we're thank very you. fortunate to have you here on the show. Nice thank to meet you. Thank you. It was a real, real pleasure. Thank you very much. Tony was so much fun to talk to, and he has so much knowledge about such a variety of subjects. It's amazing. If you'd like to see my interview with Tony that was filmed at the Southern California Genealogy Jamboree, you can do that as well. And you can view it in its entirety at the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel at youtube.com slash user slash Genealogy Gems. And if you're interested in Tony's books, I will have links to them that take you to Amazon in the show notes. And as always, when you access Amazon through the links on the Genealogy Gems website, you're actually helping to make this free podcast possible. So thanks. Lee Drew has been searching for his ancestors for 55 years, starting when he was just five years old and could write those long words and letters to distant relatives asking for any information that they have on their family and ancestors. Well, today, his genealogy data and digital genealogy photos, documents, and research notes require about, about three terabytes of storage space. In the early 1970s, Lee built the first personal computer ever marketed the IMSAI 8080, hoping to learn enough to use computers for research. Since then, he's built and owned over 100 computers and servers to store and organize his data. Lee says, to date, the perfect solution hasn't quite presented itself yet. Well, today, Lee Drew is as busy as ever with his genealogy research, including maintaining several family history-related websites, including his famhist.com website about that family he is continually discovering, and his famhist blog at famhist2.blogspot.com, and his Lineage Keeper blog, all about his ancestors, their diaries, and letters, at lineagekeepers.com. Dot blogspot.com. Well, over the last year, I've really enjoyed reading Lee's blog and the stories that he posts there, and it occurred to me that you would enjoy them too. And not just enjoy reading them, but hearing them from the author himself. So I've invited genealogy blogger Lee Drew to the show to tell us a story about quilts, the quilts of his ancestors and of his childhood. So Sit back and enjoy My Mother Was a Quilter by Lee Drew. This is Lee Drew of the Fam Hist blog. My Mother Was a Quilter. A cascade of vintage quilting fabric brought back memories of growing up with a mother who was a quilter. As the caboose in the family, I frequented the quilting bees that she attended because there was no one else at home to tend me. My parents raised my older siblings during the Depression and were grateful to have the cloth that came from flour sacks to make pajamas and aprons, probably the blouses to wear under my sister's jumpers. Even though I was born two decades later than them, I also heard the constant refrain of wear it out, use it up, do without. 
The extreme lessons learned in the Depression never left my parents' minds. Hence the pattern of the vintage fabric produced a flashback of laying my bored, tired young body under a quilt frame with a quilt stretched across it. Surrounding me were the legs of a dozen women, all wearing similarly patterned dresses, thick holes on their legs and sturdy shoes. I could still hear their constant chatter, their laughter, and the occasional ouch from an errant stitch. Once the chickens in that coop started to cluck, my eyes could rarely stay open for more than two minutes. Maybe someone should sell that sound as a sleep aid for children and for men. Of course, I married a quilter. Not necessarily by conscious thought, but certainly to my delight. The craft is passed on to our daughters and daughters-in-law now. When I sit in my chair in the living room and they all gather in the room to discuss their latest projects, designs, and favorite fabric patterns, the two-minute rule is still in effect. Cackle, cackle, cluck, cluck, and then the story begins. Unfortunately, all of the guys in our family think there's a downside to our wives' hobby. Sometimes we are dragged by them, usually screaming, to a fabric store. Reading the Pickles comic strip makes me think the creator has a copy of the security tapes from my visit to these stores. I'm obviously the inspiration for the strips that cover the subject of quilting. Mom's quilting legacy lives on in the current generations. They don't make many quilts out of old Levi's and worn out shirts like Mom did, but they do help several quilting stores in the area but remain viable. I'm glad the legacy is being passed on to our granddaughters. They are full of creative ideas, and they are bonding with their older quilters in the family, sometimes in ways that makes me smile. I wonder how far back the quilting talent can be traced in their lineage. It was probably less fun for the earlier generations. Our grandmothers were sewing clothing to wear and quilts to put on their bed to warm them, rather than enjoying the current creations that are produced under less pressure and thus with probably a little more enjoyment of the experience. Looking at some of the designs in my grandmother's old quilts makes me think that there was more than a little bit of whimsy stitched into their designs though. The patterns are obvious, but when you explore the stitches closely, you often discover the quilter's initials and other signature stitch designs. I can tell which quilter was which. If you spend just a few minutes more, you can see the elongated and crooked and loose stitches that were made by the young folks in the family who were being taught the craft as they sat in on a quilting bee. All the quilts that the ladies in our family make are treasure. They are just pure treasure. Now that's family history that you can touch. Would you like to boost your genealogy research and break through those brick walls? Well, here's your answer. Become a Genealogy Gems Premium Member. You'll get two extra members-only episodes every month packed with great tips that you can use right away and instructional videos walking you through the best internet tools step-by-step. Step. In the current series called Google, a goldmine of genealogy gems, I'll show you how to get the most out of Google. If you enjoy the Genealogy Gems podcast, then you're going to love being a Genealogy Gems premium member. This is Tim Cox. I'm a premium member, and I have been for a while. I just wanted to call and let you know that I really enjoyed being a premium member, and one of the perks I like about it is the videos. I learned how to build my own genealogy dashboard. The videos were called Google, a gold mine of genealogy gem, and because I made that dashboard, I'm able to monitor all the blogs and the websites that interest me, and I was able to create tabs so each tab has different topics and just go to each one I want. This is like the best thing since sliced bread. So Lisa, thank you for what you're doing and I really do enjoy your podcast. 
to become a premium member, go to my website at genealogygems.tv and click the Join Today button. And by entering the special coupon code SAVE20, that's S-A-V-E-2-0, you'll get 20% off the annual membership. Genealogy Gems Premium Membership. It's where you belong. Profile America, Sunday, August 2nd. It may seem rudimentary by today's standards, but for many decades, the only way Americans visually witnessed the news was in weekly newsreels screened before the feature motion pictures at local theaters. That's the way Americans saw Lindbergh's Atlantic flight, major sporting events, and the unfolding developments of World War II. The first newsreel in the U.S. was seen this week in 1911, as the French company Pathé made its first weekly release to theaters. Over the years, the most popular newsreels were those of movie tone. Now we can watch news continually on television, including big stories as they happen. Homes across the nation have an average of 2.7 television receivers. You can find these and more facts about America from the U.S. Census Bureau online at census.gov. Well, we've come to the end of episode number 69 of the Genealogy Gems podcast. My thanks to my very special guest, Tony Burroughs, who you can find at TonyBurroughs.com, and of course, Lee Drew of the Lineage Keeper blog at LineageKeeper.blogspot.com. To stay up on everything going on at Genealogy Gems, be sure and sign up for the free e-newsletter. Just go to the website at genealogygems.tv and click the sign up button that you'll find in the left hand column. And when you do that, you're going to get my 20 page free ebook on Google research strategies as a special thank you gift. And mark your calendars and join me at the Family History Expo in Sandy, Utah, just outside of Salt Lake City, August 28th and 29th of 2009. I'll be there teaching three classes as well as videotaping interviews for Family History Expo's TV. And of course, I will be at the Genealogy Gems booth in the exhibit hall. So for more information on the expo or to register, go to FamilyHistoryExpos.com. And finally, if you have any questions or comments about the podcast, you can always email me at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.